In this video, I'm going to offer a response to John McRae, which is otherwise known as What Do You Meme, to his short video, How They Get You, Progressive Christianity, which has over 460,000 views on YouTube. Um, now, the first two minutes of the video, McRae talks about how he, years ago, he went to a church, which sounds like a very narrow fundamentalist church that had a lot of arbitrary markers for in-group versus out-group, things that you don't be part of the world, and really sounds quite cultic. And eventually, he extricated himself from that cultic church context, and he uh, found his way toward a more orthodox Christianity. And two minutes into the video, which is where we're going to jump into it, he now segues to begin to talk about progressive Christianity. So we'll start from that point. Way and we left. Now, I think that a lot of the people who find themselves attracted to progressive Christianity find themselves coming from a background that's somewhat similar to the one that I came from in the sense that they too had a series of negative experiences with church or the church's teachings. And at some point, they came to find that progressive Christianity didn't entail all of those negative and socially uncomfortable things that they come to learn in their church. So once they started expanding past their church walls, they started going out into the world and realizing that the world isn't as much of a scary place as they were initially led to believe. And then they started meeting people who would identify as homosexual or people who were non-believers and then they ended up loving those people and befriending them. So then when this happens they eventually end up feeling conflicted and a lot of them end up feeling bitter towards the church. Eventually when they come across progressive Christianity they realize that they would no longer have to conclude that their non-believing friends weren't saved or they wouldn't have to reject all of the socially awkward teachings that are found in the Bible or that they learned from their church. And it was also the first time that they heard that Jesus was basically a social justice warrior and they can have views that didn't cut against the dominant cultural thought in our day. And okay, so uh, a few things I just want to comment here uh, in this first bit. Uh, so McCray is here speculating without any evidence about what he thinks progressive Christianity is. I mean, he's not quoting people. He's not citing survey data, but he's just giving his general ruminations or speculations. So treat that as you will, right? Um, it doesn't follow that he's giving an accurate description of how people actually reason. Uh, the next thing though, is that when he talks about progressive Christianity, he talks about it as some monolithic movement or formal religious group to which one converts, which it's not, it's not that at all. What progressive Christianity is, is a term that is used typically referring to, or that people use for themselves when they're coming out of a conservative Christian background and beginning to critique that conservative Christian background. That's all it is. Um, so it, it, there's, there's no formal movement to which you, are con, you could convert. Rather, it's simply beginning to question and challenge and rethink your theology in particular respects. Uh, and that is how progressive Christians commonly use the term. Certainly when I describe myself as a progressive Christian or progressive evangelical to the extent that I do so, it is uh, set against that backdrop. McCray talks about, in, in a very, I think, condescending way, about the idea of Jesus as a, quote, social justice warrior, which I think is, is, is a really unfortunate way to diminish what I think is a really serious recognition of the full social implications of the gospel. Because conservative evangelicals and Christian fundamentalists have a very long and, I think, dangerous and regrettable history of marginalizing the social implications of the gospel and sort of putting it off to the next life rather than to recognize that yes the gospel should impact how we interact with the poor and the marginalized and the disenfranchised and how we envision a more just society in our own day and age you can't give people a tract and save their soul if you're not willing to give them a meal when they're starving for example it doesn't mean that you're a quote social justice warrior that you come when you come to recognize that fact nor did they have to feel shame for things that they did because they learned that God was love and love means total acceptance. So you shouldn't feel bad about anything. So that is outrageous. Uh, McCray says that progressive Christians say, well, because God is love, you should never feel shame about anything. I don't know anybody who says that. Th this idea that like God affirms automatically whatever you do, right? Oh, it's fine. You don't have to feel bad about that. Whatever you do, that's fine. That is a straw man caricature of the first order. There's simply, I don't meet people who talk and think like that. Uh, rather, their understanding of right and wrong, good and evil may have, may have modified, changed in certain respects from when they were a conservative Christian 
yes, they come to think differently about some issue like sexual ethics or uh, guns uh, for a, a one that's uh, currently on the top of mind of our culture. When, when I meet Christians who are really enthusiastic about polishing their AR-15 submachine guns or uh, semi-automatic weapons, and uh, they don't see any potential conflict between wielding their AR-15 at a target and practicing how to pulpify human beings in two seconds. They don't see any tension between that and their Christian discipleship. And then another person says, actually, I do see a, a tension there. And they now come to maybe a more progressive perspective on that. It's not that they don't feel any shame or guilt anymore. It's that, no, they actually have an evolving and emerging sense of that for which they should feel guilty that which is right, that which is wrong. So to suggest they have no moral framework at all is just a, again, a straw man caricature. So if I'm right here and I had similar issues with Christianity that progressive Christianity seemed to solve, then why didn't I become a progressive Christian? Well, obviously a lot of things have happened since I left the church and I have to save some of those things for other videos. But to keep a long story short, there's three main parts to that answer. The first one is I eventually found myself on an authentic truth searching journey. Now note the language here. McCray is saying, why didn't I become a progressive Christian? Because I found myself on, on, on an authentic search for, for God and truth, which of course implies that people who would call themselves progressive in their theology are not on an authentic search, which I think is deeply problematic. I just wanted to simply know what was true. And I got to the point where I realized that I didn't want God to be true just for me and just to make me happy. I wanted him to be true despite me and my thoughts and my life. I just wasn't interested in trying to find a God that was subjectively true. But instead, I wanted to know if there was a God who was both subjectively and objectively true. So if I don't even know what that is supposed to mean. And I don't know any self-described progressive Christian who says, I only care if God is subjectively true, or my beliefs about God are subjectively true, but not objectively true. First of all, again, I don't even know what that means. Second of all, I don't know anybody who talks like that or thinks like that. Uh, all the people that I know, and the people that I've read, who would identify to some degree with progressive Christianity, or would get identified as such, they all are seeking to know that which is true. They're all on a journey that is in their intents and purposes, no less authentic than that which McRae is on, they may have come to different conclusions, doesn't mean you demonize them and suggest they are not concerned with truth at all. Eventually I came to a point where I realized that if my God was so small that he wouldn't contradict me and my opinions or our current social ethics, then instead of finding God and serving him, I'm really only looking into the mirror and ultimately just serving myself. I just okay, so here McRae is saying, the the problem with progressive christianity is that it has it gives you a god that just agrees with the society uh, but then you just end up with a god in your own image whereas the authentic god that i guess the non-progressive christian is really seeking is the god who doesn't simply give you a mirror image of yourself but who actually gives you uh, a, a god who challenges society and ethics well the first thing i would say here is that i Based upon this framing of the issue, I think McCray just shows a real unfortunate lack of awareness about the degree to which conservative Christians can be in cap captivity to the culture no less than any other Christian. For example, I mentioned earlier the love of guns that is so common among Americans, which I as a Canadian do not understand. Um, and when I see American conservative evangelicals who love their AR-15s as much as any non-Christian American church person, unchurched person, I wonder, are they in Babylonian captivity at that point to the culture? When I see Christians who present the gospel as a lifestyle complement, such as in the health and wealth gospel or the health and wealth light gospel, I wonder, are these people who are not in cultural captivity? When I see conservative Christians who as any surveyed group, white evangelicals in particular in the United States have the highest distrust of immigrants and refugees. I say, is that not a cultural group that is in captivity to the culture? When conservative Christians jump onto the bandwagons of nationalism uh, and support wars that their country is going into and wave the flag to support the wars and invoke God on their side, are they not in cultural captivity? When, when, um, when people, Christians, show no concern for the environment 
and have unsustainable levels of material consumption in society and have become for all intents and purposes just consumerists or materialists, are they not in cultural captivity? Yes, the short answer is. And yet uh, it seems to me reading between the lines that what McCray is really highlighting here is the degree to which some progressive Christians have rethought aspects of so, so sexual ethics. I suspect that is the issue that is really driving his analysis here, is the extent to which they have become more open to or reevaluated the traditional Christian prohibition of same-sex relationships, gay marriage, or things like trans rights, uh, how to understand uh, gender and its relation to sexuality, and the extent to which they then adopt positions on those issues, which are more in line with the contemporary culture. He says, well, they're just, in essence, capitulating to the culture. Um, this is the other side that I, I think we need to, to, to point out is, okay, 50 years ago, Christians, conservative Christians were very much part of the segregation movement and were in, against the civil rights movement back in the 1950s and 60s, leading conservative white evangelicals opposed the civil rights movement and viewed that as suspicion and raised the same objections to quote unquote progressive Christians that were supporting the civil rights movement as Christians today, like McCray, presumably are raising against the progressives. Now, it, it doesn't mean that um, a modified view of the ethics of same-sex relationships is equivalent to uh, the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The point is, however, that you can't just stipulate that because a particular group happens to align on some issue with the wider culture, that that group is thereby capitulating to the culture on the contrary, it may be that they are more correctly understanding the implications of the gospel than the conservative Christians who in this moment happen to be disagreeing with the culture. I just wasn't interested in that. I wanted to know God for who he was, not who I was. Secondly, even though progressive Christianity claims to have the foundation of their teachings grounded in Jesus' commandment to love, I came to realize that their conception of love is just kind of like more along the lines of our modern conception of love, which is grounded in more or less just personal feelings. The more that I talk to and listen to- Okay, who, who is this? Um, again, McCray talks in a very monolithic way. Well, all progressive Christians, their views are a particular subject of modern view of love. Well, give me the data. Who are you? Who did you talk to? Who are the people that you read? Uh, what are their actual views that they've articulated that would justify you making these kinds of broad sweeping allegations? To progressives, the more that I came to realize that ultimately they often confuse loving others with making people feel good. And I knew that that was a flawed understanding, both practically and biblically. Now, don't Okay, it's obviously the case that making people feel good is not of an, in and of itself necessarily a loving thing. It all depends, right? But again, we come back to the same issue because I think, again, once again, I think sexual ethics is really the big thing here for people like McCray in this video is to the extent that um, those who would call themselves progressive adopt a quote-unquote progressive view on sexual ethics, which then affirms the self-understanding of particular people who are gay or trans or whatever, that that is then undermining their ethic. But again, you can say the same thing about Christians who are defending the civil rights movement, who are defending racial integration in marriage, such as in the loving Supreme Court decision 1967, which gave it as a right that people uh, can marry across their, their ethnic lines um, and have interracial marriages, not ethnic, but, but racial, race, interracial marriages, that because you were affirming a black and a white person's right to marry one another, which makes them feel good, does it follow that you are thereby capitulating to the culture and that you don't have an ethical reason to believe that they should be able to marry? Of course not. In the same way, in principle, it could be that the, the right for two people of the same sex to be able to marry uh, even though it makes them feel good, maybe it's also the right thing to do. So the fact that you identify this as something that makes a person feel good does not in and of itself tell you anything about the ethics of the position. Don't get me wrong, love often does make people feel good, but ultimately, if you love someone, you want to do what's best for that person. And sometimes doing what's best for them doesn't make them happy. A lot of times you have to- That is true. And I don't know anybody who would disagree with that. Fair enough. But I don't know that progressive Christians, the ones that I know, or people who identify as progressive, don't disagree with that. But he's setting it up and framing them as if they 
I mean, and in fact, he explicitly said it, right? That they view love as just what makes you feel good, which is just not the case. To look past their initial happiness and look towards the long-term goal, kind of like how a good parent will choose what's best for their child, regardless if it makes their child feel good or bad. The progressives that I know and the ones that I've listened to seem hopelessly confused on this point because they're not able to make distinctions between love as a feeling and love that extends far past our cultural or personal feelings. And Okay, who, who are they? Please name names. Uh, let me know who are the progressives you've listened to that are unable to have an adequate understanding of love. I would love to know who those individuals are. Lastly, and most importantly, I came to realize that the gospel shaves away at all of these problems as well. I realized that Christianity isn't a club for people who are better than others or are more spiritual or more moral or anything like that. None of those things save us. We're only saved due to what Christ has done for us. And the more that we realize this, the more our identity begins to shift into something a lot more stable. Think about it. If we come to believe that the thing that makes us valuable is our group, whether it's our favorite church or being part of a liberal social justice movement, or even if it relies on anything that we do, then our value is ultimately on shaky grounds. And to be honest, ultimately, it's going to disappoint us. As well, I would say the same thing about Christians who have collapsed Christianity into something like the Republican Party, or fidelity to Donald Trump, guns, nationalism, all of the things that I do believe are deep problems in conservative and evangelical Christianity. So while I think John's making here some perfectly legitimate points, um, they're not points that pertain particularly to quote unquote progressive Christianity, but just pertain to Christianity in general. Um, which again, to conclude, my big problem with, with the video is it presents progressive Christianity as this monolithic entity. Um, McCray makes a bunch of sweeping statements about it, says that these are people he's talked to and listened to, but doesn't give any names, but just gives his what I think are very tendentious, questionable conclusions as to what these people believe that are not grounded in fact, certainly not in uh, the evidence that I've seen of these individuals. I've never again seen any progressive Christians saying, I only care if God is subjectively true according to my whims, not whether he's objectively true. I don't see that. People don't argue like that. What we have here ultimately then I think is just a big straw man, uh, which I think completely poisons the well and undermines the willingness of people to have an open mind when their neighbors under the aegis of progressive Christianity may be raising some perfect legitimate, perfectly legitimate critiques of the conservative Christianity from which they've come.